So um, let's begin with the last session today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing two speakers that um, are going to present this session. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Joe Feinberg. Dr. John Feinberg? Professor John Feinberg? No, not Professor. <laughs> Dr. John Feinberg, um, the author of a book called The, the Paradox of Authenticity. Uh, he's employed at the uh, Philosophical or Philosophy Institute here in the uh, Czech Academy of Sciences. And um, uh, he is uh, in, in employed in the Department of uh, Czech, uh, Czech Philosophy. The, mm, Department of the Mother of Czech Philosophy. <laughs> uh, his, uh, his research interests vary from Marxist philosophy to folklore studies. And um, the second speaker, um, uh, after, okay, later. Okay, so please start. It'll be super. Floor, sir. Okay, thanks a lot for coming, and thanks again to Jana who will eventually watch this video, who really did a, put a lot of work into making this happen. So, um, really, it's really too bad she couldn't be here today. Um, let me also start just with a little caveat. Um, I took rather seriously the idea that this is a workshop, so I'm going to present something that's really a, a work in progress. Um, and uh, I think to really get something more definitive on um, topic I'm going to present on it really will require more extensive study of uh, the writings of uh, Kierkegaard and Adorno, and in particular of what Adorno wrote about Kierkegaard, um, although in some respects what he wrote about Kierkegaard is not always what's most relevant to, work, to my comparison of the two, um, but I'll be very interested in what uh, comments you might have uh, when we get to the discussion period. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, first, just to start a, f a few words on this relationship between Kierkegaard and Adorno, uh, I would say it's, uh, it seems to be kind of an uneasy affair between the two. Adorno seems to have loved Kierkegaard a bit the way that Kierkegaard loved uh, his fiancée Regina Olsen, who <coughs> Uh, he convinced himself that he, he had to be rid of what he loved. He spent his career ruminating on this, this loss. Um, and and uh, when it wasn't uh, Kierkegaard himself that Adorno pursued in, in much of his later work, we see what you might consider something like do doppelgangers of Kierkegaard. Um, similar to the way Kierkegaard himself he fled, uh, fled Copenhagen to study in Berlin, he ran into a woman who looked just like Regina when he was there, and he seemed to be pursued by, by her where he went. Um, this is a reference to the, the backstory of Kierkegaard's own life that is always read into his philosophical works and which comes into his own works in, in this complicated uh, layer of, of uh, stories that he explicitly tells and then stories that we take for granted in the the overall kind of gossipy background of these layers of, of narrating the stories that he's telling about philosophy. Uh, but I uh, mentioned, uh, so Adorno's first book, not his best known book, but his first uh, properly fully published book, it was entitled Kierkegaard, Construction of the Aesthetic, um, which Adorno actually considered to be his farewell to a thinker who had obsessed him throughout his youth. Uh, this was written in Adorno's late 20s and incidentally published the day that Hitler came to power in 1933. Uh, and according to Bartholomew Ryan, who's written a bit about Kierkegaard and Adorno, as well as Kierkegaard's intersection with other, uh, other later thinkers, uh, Adorno, this is quoting Ryan, Adorno argues that Kierkegaard fall, fails to develop a dialectic and that Kierkegaard's turn toward inwardness leads further into despair and to the conclusion, to the exclusion of the possibility of social change. Uh, contrary to Ryan, I would tend to agree with this assessment of Kierkegaard uh, made by Adorno, 
And in a sense, we can see Adorno's own quest for a negative dialectic as a kind of attempt to right this wrong that he saw, this inadequate inadequacy, this wrong turn taken by Kierkegaard. Um, so to work through the central problem of Kierkegaard's thought, from which Kierkegaard himself fled. Uh, at the same time, it's worth mentioning that this is also, it wasn't really Adorno's last farewell because he returns to Kierkegaard some, several times in his later work. Uh, but that's, this uh, sort of intellectual biography is not what most interests me now. Uh, what I want to look at is, is if we look back at the philosophical pretensions that Kierkegaard at certain moments uh, seems to hold, we can still see, although Adorno says Kierkegaard, uh, he fails to develop a dialectic. Nevertheless, we can see moments where he points to something dialectical, uh, explicitly talking about dialectics. And, and Kierkegaard is tricky to pin down. He you know, famously uses pseudonyms. All of his philosophical assertions are assertions made by some fictitious character who's the supposed author of the book. Uh, he makes sort of feints in this direction and then turns actually to go in a different direction when he's writing. And so he says he's going to be writing dialectics and then writes something that could be something entirely different and yet may not be. Uh, nevertheless, I think we can sort of trace these, these feints and false starts as, as uh, interesting moments that are provocative and might lead towards interesting further reflection on dialectics. Uh, and we can see that Kierkegaard, yeah, he not only criticizes Hegelian philosophy, but he also proposes his own philosophy, or the philosophy at any rate of his, his narrators, um, even while he only partially develops this philosophy. Uh, and we can take a look back at some of this unfinished business of Kierkegaard's in order to look with fresh eyes on the business that then Adorno would take forward later, and which Adorno, I think fortunately for us, also um, didn't entirely complete, and perhaps necessarily left incomplete, necessary from his own perspective of, of what uh, dialectical philosophy uh, should be. So uh, I think the first place I want to start in looking back at Kierkegaard through the eyes of having already read Adorno, uh, is the provocative subtitle of Kierkegaard's well-known, perhaps best-known book, Fear and Trembling. The subtitle is A Dialectical Lyric. This was unfortunately left out of the, the translation that I actually posted on the, the readings that were shared. Uh, but it was in the original, and some English translations do, do maintain it. A Dialectical Lyric. Um, this, this notion of, of a lyric that can be dialectical, I'd like to suggest, it seems to throw down two kind of gauntlets, set, lay out two, two challenges, both of which Adorno uh, will later take up in his own indirect way. Uh, first, we should note, Kierkegaard uses the term dialectic rather loosely, well, certainly he doesn't provide a, a definition of it in any clear way, in, uh, in, in, this, in the book, Fear and Trembling, which has this subtitle. Uh, when he uses it, he seems to s refer to any situation in which there is a contradiction, a paradox. So he talks about the, the dialectical elements in the story of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, he says, it's, this dialectical element is the fact that the story presents us with uh, what he calls a monstrous paradox. Um, so even while Kierkegaard rejects Hegel's dialectical system, he seems to fully accept Hegel's characterization of reality as contradictory. Uh, and as in Hegel's account, these contradictions operate as a kind of motive force which drives subjects to action as they confront the objective paradoxes uh, of their existence or of the, the objectified world around them that they confront. Uh, but but the notion of a lyric, a dialectical lyric, that a lyric, something that's a lyric, can be dialectical, it, it also suggests an additional element on which, uh, as far as I know, Hegel never uh, directly reflected, although I'd be happy to, 
to hear to be corrected by Hegel scholars in the audience. And that's that dialectics uh, is, are bound up in structures of poetics. Uh, so if Hegel related dialectics to history, it seems that Kierkegaard is relating dialectics to the telling of history, or the telling of stories. Uh, the, that is to say, to the temporal order of the subject's expression of action as it's unfolding. Uh, now, just, just a brief aside, I wonder if we think about this suggestion. What does it mean if, if dialectics, if, if we think of dialectics as a kind of narration, uh, what th might that mean for how we conceptualize dialectics? And also when we go back in, in the history of dialectical thought, this is just maybe, yeah, just a, a side thought, whether we might then look not at Plato or Heraclitus as the sort of founding father of dialectics, but Aristotle's poetics as a foundational work that shows us this structure of how uh, some kind of protagonist becomes entangled in tension and then pushes towards this disentanglement, denouement. Um, not to say that Heraclitus and Plato don't have their own important roles, um, as well as a long history after that. Uh, but now, to go back to what I consider the second implicit challenge that's posed by Kierkegaard's subtitle here. If Kierkegaard polemically posits a dialectical lyric against some other kind of dialectics, he seems to be suggesting that his, his uh, polemical other engages in dialectics of, of some different form. So, so if his approach is lyrical, if it rejects some other uh, narrative temporality in favor of this fleet, fleeting moment of, of passion and expression of faith, uh, then does this mean that each narrative genre presents its own form of dialectics? And can we see in Kierkegaard's confrontation with Hegel, and then later Adorno's confrontation with orthodox Marxist dialectics, uh, also confrontations between competing modes of narration? To look more closely at Kierkegaard, uh, I think there, there are three crucial moves that Kierkegaard makes from this perspective uh, with respect to Hegel's dialectic. Uh, the first, well, is sort of a two contained in one, uh, one move. Um, first, uh, it seems that he breaks up the subject into two pieces, because there's the question of the narrator as well as a protagonist. Again, this is implicit. This isn't a poetic theory that Kierkegaard works out, but the idea of, of a dialectical lyric suggests that the, there's something about the subject that's also a kind of narrator. Uh, Whereas in Hegel's own thought, and again, I'd be interested in what Hegel scholars uh, say about this, the, the figure of the narrator is not, uh, is not taken up as, as a problem the same way that the figure of the subject is. I think, at least I know many Marxist Hegelians have taken up this question of how one can write, how one can know the world that one is trying to understand, how one can write about uh, uh, write about ideology, for example, um, without being outside of this system. Um, so this positioning of, of essentially of the narrator, of, of the writer, of the, 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 the scientist or analyst or critic uh, is, is important. Um, and it might, it might be more uh, implicit in, in Hegel, but in any case, what we see is, is Kierkegaard's sort of uh, polemically pushing against both both of these aspects of, of the subject in Hegel. They, so he rejects Hegel's protagonist, so he turns away from the singular hero that, that unifies the Hegelian narrative in Kierkegaard's understanding of that narrative. Um, so there's this singular hero that stars in episode after episode, overcoming successive obstacles before achieving a final triumph, um, the spirit. And Kierkegaard's protagonist changes from story to story and each telling to telling. So each individual then faces his own paradoxes, even while the narrator might tell 
others' stories. The narrator becomes the protagonist of a story, uh, of, of his own story. Um, the story of Abraham is also the story of the, the alleged author, Johannes de Silentio. And because we read Kierkegaard knowing his own biography, it becomes then also the story of Kierkegaard's own struggle with his love for Regina Olsen and his inability to play the role that he thought he should play if he were to continue, uh, to continue his courtship of her. Then the second element of this is that Kierkegaard rejects Hegel's narrator. So he rejects the, alleged, the allegedly objective position of a philosopher that could scientifically establish systematic truths about the unfolding of paradoxes with uh, the omniscience that an epic singer approaches a, a tale. The epic singer has a kind of knowledge of all affairs, human and divine, has the capacity to fit all stories into one overarching, to one overarching um, narrative. And in this narrator's place, Kierkegaard placed the individual subject who approached the contradiction the way that the lyric poet approaches expression as, uh, as a task that the subject faces alone. Uh, and then the third thing that Kierkegaard rejects is Hegel's denouement. He, he refused, Kierkegaard refused to accept that the most central contradictions faced by the subject could be dialectically overcome. Uh, so there's no final chapter in the story to the story of Abraham in which the patriarchs intended murder could become a good and ethical act. So a Abraham must not kill and he must obey God. These are two irreconcilable imperatives. And Kierkegaard recognizes no greater plot above them which might turn the, the evil act into something good. Uh, there's no grander historical knowledge that Abraham possesses. He, he doesn't, Abraham doesn't know the Bible that would tell him that this is actually a good act because it's going to turn out well and because we know that uh, this is all part of a grander scheme. Abraham still remains, in, in Kierkegaard's telling, Abraham remains someone who would have murdered his own son, but he also remains someone who chose faith in God. And this, this contradiction remains there. So the story ends with, with the tension uh, unresolved, but at the same time, the ironic remove that Kierkegaard produces by placing this fictitious narrator between himself and the text lends the story to possible retellings with alternative endings. It, it almost invites the reader to say, no, uh, that's not the decision that I would make, um, as later readers have actually done, um, to retell the story in a, in a different way. Uh, so, so we, we then see when Adorno comes much later, he's struggling with some similar, some parallel problems, um, a, a different, but a different set of dialectical narratives that he sees as the, the primary targets of his confrontation. Uh, the, the main banner of, of Descartes, the epic style of dialectics is no longer this reception of Hegel from the early 19th century that, that uh, Kierkegaard was dealing with, but this Marxian, uh, orthodox Marxian reception of dialectics from the mid-20th century. And so when, uh, and this, what we see is that there's kind of this, this narrative that has come in the into Soviet Marxism, let's say, in the 20th century. It involves an epic that has started to subsume its own lyrical moments. There are these moments of celebratory affirmation of the post-revolutionary moment that was supposed to have already achieved this reconciliation that Hegelian dialectics had, had promised before. Um, so this is a different kind of lyricism from Kierkegaard's, which expressed the anguish and melancholy of a moment still rife with contradiction, but rather it's supposed to be the lyric of a moment after contradiction has ended, or as it's about to end. Uh, and so this is what Adorno comes up against. He, he, uh, he sees that there, there's no room in a society that, so, that remains so clearly contradictory for this appearance of non-contradiction. Uh, 
But at the same time, he doesn't deny the human desire for the non-contradictory, which is also, I would add, the desire for narration. The desire to find out how suspense will be resolved, how, where will it go. Uh, so Adorno's negative dialectics is also a, an attempt to understand the reality of contradiction faced uh, with this inexorable desire for non-contradiction. Um, and in this attempt to figure out how to tell this story that has no definitive end, uh, Adorno moves from here to there and, and tells this, this very different non-linear story of how we are moving back and forth and trying to work through this, this plot that, again, like in Kierkegaard, it never ends, but it, it never ends in a different way. Uh, there's no justification for a leap of faith that might take us even temporarily beyond contradiction uh, and impose some kind of momentary identity between the, the protagonist and all the obstacles close to it. And I think we can even hear, see here uh, an echo of Adorno's famous aphorism that it, it is barbaric to write poetry after Auschwitz. If we understand poetry here as specifically lyrical poetry that presumes a world without contradiction, again, this is also a specific kind of lyrical poetry that presumes a world without contradiction, uh, but even Kierkegaard, it's, it's the lyric itself that overcomes the contradiction only because it sort of finds its moment, this, faith, this moment of faith that can push through contradiction within its own lyric and without denying that the contradiction continues to exist around it. Um, after Auschwitz, this becomes barbaric uh, if, we, if we understand it in this way. Uh, and, and so in the sense that Adorno establishes that social contradiction can't can't be overcome, we could also we could call this dialectics tragic in some sense. Adorno tells the story of human attempts to work through contradiction, looking in vain for ways out. Um, and in this respect, Adorno is parallel to uh, another philosopher who was influenced by Kierkegaard, the Spanish existentialist uh, Miguel de Unamuno, who titled his best known and very Kierkegaardian book, uh, The Tragic Sense of Life. But I think there's also a difference, because whereas Unamuno re remained within Kierkegaard's existentialist terms, um, and so that the contradictions that Unamuno works with are eternal and immutable contradictions. The human being is always faced with death. The human being always wants life and is faced with death. The human being uh, faces God eternally and can never find proof in God's existence and yet desires some kind of God. This is Unamuno's attitude, this kind of tragedy. Um, for, but for Adorno, these contradictions are historically determined. Auschwitz has become the symbol for a historic failure to overcome contradiction. And so the overcoming of any given contradiction might give way to other, other contradictions, other failures, other maybe partial successes that lead to further contradictions. And, and each, each of these sets of contradiction is historically given. And so history has taken the form of tragedy, but that doesn't a priori preclude the possibility that it might take other forms. And so to, to move quickly towards the end, um, I'd like to leave for discussion the question of what other genres of dialectics might be possible. Um, and just a brief conclusion on what this may mean about what dialectics are or can be. Uh, so to, to return to this idea of dialectics returning, can there be dialectics after all? Uh, can, can there be dialectics after Althusser, you could say, in some sense? Um, after the so-called death of the narrator or, or subject or author, um, attributing a lot of people to Althusser, <laughs> um, but he was an influential figure. Uh, whose name has a nice beginning letter. Um, so can there be dialectics without a spirit that tells and stars in the story? So what I'm trying to lay out is this, this possibility that, uh, that I think this engagement between Adorno and Kierkegaard might open up, that dialectics can be a mode that shifts as narration and subjectivity shift. And 
that it might be possible that at one moment capitalism turns world history into a single overarching dialectic, or at least an experience of such a single overarching dialectic, but it's an experience rooted in this totality, a totalizing structure of capitalism. And at another moment, this might be fragmented as a historically specific form. Uh, and at another moment, it might be moving towards something new. Uh, and yet the, the world might still work dialectically be, because humans are condemned to perceive the world dialectically. In other words, to perceive the world as a series of tensions, of suspense that they try to work through and retell and look for the answers to. And I'll leave it there.